that what I was going to be talking about is uh, actually we got a head start on, on what the whole goal of this meeting was. Uh, we started this about three years ago when Alan uh, Foley at Argonne got together with the Dean of Engineering here at Northwestern and held a uh, poster session to try and see what different ways that Argonne and Northwestern could uh, work together. Uh, this was at a time when Argonne was going over its uh, rebidding its contract and they brought on Northwestern University, I think the University of Illinois at Chicago, as well as uh, University of Illinois down in Champaign on the board of directors to operate uh, uh, Argonne National Lab. And uh, there it is down here. And so we started this uh, during that poster session. I saw one of my colleagues here. I don't know if Jane Lang is still, Jane's up there. And I pulled her aside and said, we ought to go talk to Alan Foley and your dean and see if they can get us uh, some work, some funding to start working together. And uh, we've been working on this and we've, we actually are starting to work together on some projects. And so one of the things that came out of this was the uh, establishment of a virtual center called the Illinois Center for Advanced Tribology. Now, if I can figure this out, what I should first do is go back and describe really what tribology is. Uh, I'm hoping most of you understand what it is. Uh, it's not the study of tribes. Uh, it's not three, three biologists or something like that. It actually, and you're laughing at that, but uh, there's a story. Uh, we get a lot of our funding from the Department of Energy, and one of our sponsors in the Department of Energy just told us to stop using the word tribology because he could not explain it to the congressional staffers. And it was particularly critical because at that time our funding came from the, uh, through the Department of Interior who also had jurisdiction over the Bureau of Land Management, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And the congressional staffers wanted to know what the Department of Energy was doing studying tribes. So uh, uh, we had to explain very closely, he had to explain very closely that we were not studying tribes, but we were studying, in this case, uh, and I just went backwards on that. What we were actually studying was the, uh, the, the science and technology of friction wear and lubrication of, of surfaces that are sliding against one another. So that's essentially the definition of what tribology is, and it involves quite a bit more. And here I'm just listing some of the examples. One of them is actually in the area of transportation. Uh, engines and drive lines on your vehicles consume quite a bit of energy just due to friction. Friction losses when materials, when the parts slide against one another or also the viscous losses in, because of the fact that you're moving oil around. Uh, biomedical uh, applications is another thing. Uh, hip joints, knee joints, and jaws, and finger joints, and so forth. Uh, there's uh, quite a uh, large number of operations that are done a, each year to insert artificial hip joints and so forth. And uh, again, tribology is a critical thing. One of the areas how these things start to fail is that during the wear process, you generate a lot of small individual wear debris inside the body and your body looks at those wear debris particles as foreign bodies and they try and resorb and get rid of those uh, uh, that wear debris and in the process they start to dissolve it but they also dissolve the bone and so forth and so you end up with the failure of these systems and you have to get them replaced. Other applications, manufacturing, cutting tools and lubricants, aerospace industry on the uh, jet engine and so forth. Actually MEMS sensors and magnetic recording media, all of your computers that you use actually on the hard drive actually contain a very thin form of a diamond-like carbon coating together with a lubricant that's on the surface and trying to get these surfaces be very thin and have a very low flying height uh, where the head is riding up against the, uh, the disc uh, uh, is very critical. The smaller you can get that height, the higher the density you can get on the magnetic recording media. The uh, different disciplines that are involved in, in tribology involve naturally material science and mechanical engineering, quite a bit in the area of surface chemistry and chemical engineering and then uh, you're starting to see more and more people involved in the uh, use of supercomputers to model that. Now since this uh, particular workshop is focusing on, on energy demand, I thought I'd throw this slide up. This is from one of the uh, Department of Energy uh, uh, groups that uh, kind of flows uh, models and uh, collects data as to how much energy we do use. On the left side, we're showing the different type of sources of energy that are used in the United States, ranging from coal, natural gas, 
crude oil, nuclear, electric, uh, uh, renewable energy, and uh, petroleum, and where it's used. You're looking at residential use, commercial use, industrial, as well as transportation. Overall, the United States uses about 102 quads per year. One quadrillion BTU corresponds to about a half a million barrels per about a half a million barrels of oil per day. Uh, we use about 40 quads or about 18 million barrels of uh, petroleum per day. Of this overall usage, transportation course accounts for about 30% of all of the energy generated in the United States and used in the United States. Uh, in transportation, uh, this amounts to about 14 million barrels of oil per day that's used. Uh, of that 14 million, 14 million barrels of oil used per day, about 11 million barrels is used for on-road transportation, for passenger vehicles, for light trucks such as SUVs, as well as the heavy commercial trucks. And of that <coughs> 11 million barrels per day that's used, about 10% of that petroleum is consumed by friction, mechanical friction within the engine and the drive line. So you're looking at about a million barrels per day that's just lost due to friction. And so there's a significant uh, opportunity to try and reduce friction in order to conserve uh, or, or conserve uh, petroleum. Okay, the research at Argonne really comes from a number of different sources. The majority of it is focusing on vehicle technologies through the energy efficiency and renewable energy area. Uh, we also have some support through the industrial technologies group within energy efficiency. Again, both of these focus on energy efficiency, how you can reduce the amount of energy that's used. We do have support through the Department of uh, Defense with TARDEC to look at lubricants for in extreme environments. In fact, this is a topic of a, pr a program that we have with mechanical engineering department at, uh, up at Northwestern. We also have received re support through the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology, NIST, through their ATP program. And I believe that's also in conjunction with uh, Northwestern and a few other people. And then there's a number of work for other projects that we work with the private industry. In terms of Argonne's strengths and capabilities, what we bring to the table is work in synthesis, the development of advanced materials, coatings, and additives, <coughs> work on friction and wear testing and evaluation. Once you develop these advanced materials and coatings, how do they perform relative to other materials that are typically used? A uh, number of components where we go test the temperatures ranging from room temperature to 1,000 degrees C. Under either dry, lubricated, vacuum, inert gases, or actually combustible gases, under those different types of uh, environments, and really in a couple of different reciprocating modes or unidirectional sliding. And we also use a number, a wide range of loads so that we can control the actual stress that's applied, because that does influence the actual phenomena of the failure mode. Then after we do the friction wear test, the synthesis, we utilize a number of uh, uh, characterization and failure analysis techniques. Uh, many of them focus on optical and electron microscopy. We're starting to use some ion beam techniques that are really showing some promise that I'll describe. In terms of some of the examples of some of the synthesis that uh, argon is known for, uh, in the area of a diamond-like carbon, near frictionless carbon coatings, we've been working on this for a number of years. This particular uh, form of diamond-like carbon coating has really set a world's record friction coefficients down as low as 0 0.001. To put that in context, uh, if you were to slide steel against steel, you'd have a friction coefficient of around 1. If you can obtain a, a dry sliding friction coefficient around 0.1, most people are quite happy with that. We're about uh, two orders of magnitude, can be as much as two orders of magnitude lower than, than that. So we get very, very good uh, uh, friction properties on that. Uh, the group has also worked on the development of super hard nanocomposite coatings. We've been able to uh, engineer the uh, microstructure of very thin, hard uh, nitride coatings, where we go from a weak columnar microstructure to a very dense nanocomposite structure. These particular coatings can be quite hard. Hardness is up around 67 GPA. And by controlling the composition of the coatings and the additives that you put in there, you can uh, design those in such a way that they interact very beneficially with the additives that are found in many oils. 
We also have a process where it's not necessarily a tribological process, but it's an electroless nickel process that's being used to fabricate very small orifices, orifices for our diesel fuel injectors. We can produce orifices uh, that are quite long, uh, but are quite small in size, down around 50 microns in diameter. In addition to the material synthesis, we are also working on various surface texturing processes. One of them is a uh, laser micro dimpling process that we worked with a group in Israel. Uh, in this process, they're essentially using a laser to form very small dimples on a surface. This will influence the hydrodynamic uh, flow properties and you can get low friction. We're also working <clears throat> on a friction stir processing technique to introduce nanocomposite and nanomaterials in, into surface, near surface regions. And in the area of additives, the material that you find in an oil, for example, uh, we're working on nanoparticles of boric acid to improve their performance. Shown here a number of different tribological testing capabilities. All of these are essentially lab-based. They're not, not actually actual components, but they're set up in such a way that you can utilize a very well-defined uh, configuration, a ball on disk or a ring on disk. You have a point contact, a line contact, or an area contact. You can uh, uh, control the load that's applied, control the contact stresses. You can use various types of oils. You can control the temperature, control the sliding speeds, such that you can get very good conditions that you can model and reproduce. Uh, some of these are four ball, a very high contact stress that's used to look at uh, very high contact stresses in, with oils uh, down to a, re a system that we use for testing uh, uh, materials in, in hydrogen environments. Probably have about 15 different types of test rigs in our group. An example of one of these systems is a ring on liner test configuration where we'll take small segments of piston liners and, and rings, reciprocate them back and forth, and we'll monitor the temperature shown here in green as a function of time that we control, as well as the friction coefficient as we're showing it going up and down. We're actually seeing the friction coefficient decrease in this case at room temperature. And we also monitor the contact resistance between the film, which is an indication of the formation of a protective tribal film. Uh, characterization techniques are shown here. Do quite a bit of work using an optical characterization system that we can determine and measure, quantify the thickness of the tribal films that are formed, as well as the fact that these are not really uniform films. They are very heterogeneous on the surface, and the thickness varies considerably. Uh, uh, we use this quite a bit initially to look at the films, and then we start our, we're starting to use a focused ion beam technique to look at the chemical composition and microstructure of the films. In this upper uh, photograph in the right, we're showing actually a wear film that was produced on a, on a surface. You can see the wear track at Stark. Outside, it's, it's, it's a smooth surface. Uh, if you take and look at it in greater detail in cross-section, you can see that the near surface region is plastically deformed. If you go one step further and use the focus ion beam technique, which is kind of a, a backhoe, except an atomic-based backhoe, where you essentially use uh, sputtering to mill out these surfaces, and you can eventually produce a very thin film. It's about a uh, tenth of a micron thick, 10 microns wide by about five microns. This is sufficiently thin that you can then put it inside of a transmission electron microscope and see changes in the microstructure. You can see how you're starting to form a, an aligned texture in this case. But also you can look at the very near surface region. You can actually identify the formation of this protective film. You can look at its microstructure and so forth. Also utilizing time of flight secondary ion mass spectroscopy to look at the composition of films. In this case, it's a diamond-like carbon film. Looking at the wear track and seeing that it has a different composition in regions where it has not been worn. Uh, research needs and requirements that, we, that we're looking for. Uh, we're working on a couple of different things. One of the things I did not mention is that we're working with a company, Ricardo, to actually model the impact of boundary friction and hydrodynamic friction on fuel economy. In their particular models, you can very well, uh, very accurately calculate what the viscous losses are. When it comes to boundary friction and mixed friction, where you actually have the surfaces rubbing up against one another, it's a very simple model. They assume the friction is a constant, uh, which is somewhat frustrating if you want to model what the effect of a boundary friction coefficient is on overall uh, 
fuel efficiency, just assuming a constant is quite difficult. What we'd like to get into is, is utilizing some of the techniques that are developed here up at, uh, at uh, Northwestern University with Jane Wang, uh, Leon Kerr, and uh, her student, student uh, I guess Ashley Martini, she's now at Purdue, she graduated and is now teaching at Purdue. They developed a model where they can essentially f look at the effect of wear and how it changes the oil film thickness between sliding surfaces. They can actually take a representative surface finish with its surface finish, roughness and so forth, put that into the model and predict how that is going to wear as a function of time. And here you're looking at the effect of during the start of the test where there's no wear and then after these asperities have worn down, how the oil film thickness is changing and also how the contact pressure is changing. Very important factor to, to include when you uh, are trying to model the friction coefficient. I see I've got about two minutes left. The other aspect that you can look at is to do molecular dynamic simulation that they're doing at Northwestern to see how this oil film interacts between two surfaces, whether it goes from a liquid state to an ordered state and see how that works. Now we've had somewhat of a head start, as I mentioned before. We have uh, started talking not only with uh, Northwestern University and Argonne to collaborate, but we've also joined teams with uh, University of Illinois at Chicago as well as UIUC, and together we formed this virtual uh, center for advanced tribology, and we've identified a number of research themes that we would like to focus on, some of it in the area of health and biotribology. Extreme tribology is really focusing, trying to focus on military applications, which we, we have a joint program between Northwestern and Argonne with TARDEC. And then we're looking at alternative energy technologies. The use of hydrogen has some significant implications in terms of how you move hydrogen around, how you compress it uh, economically and reliably. Then there's also issues about biodiesel and ethanol, the lubricity of these fuels and the corrosive behavior on engine parts, engine components is significantly different from today's diesel fuel. And then a new area that's starting to come in with, especially with the new administration and their uh, preference for uh, renewable energies or uh, not, I shouldn't say preference, but their desire to promote uh, renewable energy quite a bit more. But there are a number of solicitations coming out in the development of wind energy as well as geothermal where tribology will have a significant impact. And so where I see the path forward is really summarized here. The capabilities at Argonne, the needs in terms of theoretical modeling, contact, failure mechanics, surface and lubricant chemistry, Establishing these teams, we have these teams established. We'd be willing, more than, uh, uh, we would welcome other people at Northwestern to, to join in on this team. We're looking for, again, the lubricant uh, chemistry is very critical. And then what the expectations are, what we need to do is to go out and identify funding sources, develop proposals and white papers, and to work with congressional delegations to obtain the funding. And the last thing I'd like to see is if there's some seed funding that can be devoted to get Northwestern and Argonne to select some particular concept, be it biomedical or wind or geothermal. Do some initial work to identify the issues and to propose some uh, topics, proposals for white papers. So with that, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.